I'm Adam Calhoun. I'm Mises. I'm Adam Calhoun. I'm Mises. Why are you moving? What's up, guys? I'm Adam Calhoun. And I'm Mises. And we just dropped right now, today, go pre-order our album, Pale Horse. What you guys are about to watch is a story that has not been told. Me and Chuck have known each other since we were kids. Hope you enjoy it. And go pre-order the, f go pre-order the album. Oh yeah, everyone that pre-orders the album, what do they get? They get a bonus song that did not make the album because we wanted it. You're not a good rapper. We wanted it. No, you're not, just say that. You guys, if you want to pre-order the album, you're gonna get a, it's never gonna be released ever. Only you will have it. It'll get sent to your email in the comments. We'll show you how to do it. If you pre-order the album, go to the comments and it'll show you how to get your song. Love you guys. Peace. So me and Chuck, we met in high school. No, Mises. What? Me and Mises met in high school. Okay, whatever. Mises didn't come till later. Fair enough. All right, so where do you want to start this shit? Where it all started. In my mom's garage. We both have been rapping. Friends connected us. But we're the only two white boys that were really rapping. First time we actually talked about it was over the phone and we were like rapping verses back and forth. That garage, that was the first place that me and Chuck ever recorded anything together and it was on a karaoke machine. How old were we? 19, bro. Who lives there now? Two gay guys. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I used to come outside and Mike would be like, hey, hey, Adam, nice fucking air, Adam. Oh, that window, man. You that, can't move on. Yeah. Yeah. Nice hair, Adam. And then when I was rapping, he'd be like, Hey, Adam, let me drive you live my way, Adam. Don't forget me, dude. I never do. All right, bro. That was Mike. He's known me my whole life. His family's the only original family that, when we moved in, is still here. He's the only one left. That's good, Mike. So that was my in my brother's bedroom that we shared. And that was the first time I ever listened to rap music in my entire life. And I used to sneak out of here. See these apartments back there? That's where I caught my first case, aggravated battery, great bodily harm. Me and my brothers climbed up to the balcony, walked in that house, and got into a fight. And uh, that changed my life and the whole trajectory of my life. That garage. Performing holding the mic, then it turned into arenas. <laughs> That's where it all started. We went from recording on a karaoke machine to recording in a closet, but it was a little better quality, and we actually had beats that people were making from scratch. We felt like we made it. It was crazy. Like, just that alone felt like, you know, such a huge jump. And we started recording songs quick, too. So we're standing right now what used to be one of the projects on the hill. They call it the hill in Joliet. As you can see now, they tore it down and it's just uh what's left of this and this was wild there was only one way in and one way out and 20 something years ago all there was was dropping bodies up here it was not a place you wanted to be but this is the first time we ever recorded was up here on the hill in joliet recorded something professionally it's a trip seeing it look like this because it was definitely not this when we were coming up here you had to check in at the top of the hill basically if you weren't from the neighborhood they were checking your plate or your car or whatever you had to be with someone with an idea card that says they lived here or you had to have one or you couldn't get in yeah this was like the wild west 20 years ago a lot of death a lot of gangs or we're standing in this gd territory it's just crazy everything that we look at from where we came from has just changed so much and i guess we have too you know big facts this is where it started though people fucked with us man they definitely fucked with what we were doing right where that ac unit's hanging there was a studio in there and that was the first place me and chuck ever recorded professionally it was in a closet and all I know is once we got that burnt CD, man, we must have listened to that shit a thousand times. Nowadays, kids can just go online and learn how to record their own shit in the safety of their own home. We didn't have that luxury back then. That's how me and Chuck kind of knew each other more is because yeah. they're like, oh, I know this other white kid that's rapping. His name's Absolute, and that was Chuck. Yeah. We were the only two white guys everywhere we went, and there were no white producers and shit like that in the suburbs, so we had to come to where we could rap, which was huge. Here. Ain't no drama tonight. Yeah, we, we, we just we made a lot of terrible <laughs> songs in that. 2020 vision. It's yeah. gonna be like that till like 2020. Here we are, 2024. Yeah. Still doing this shit. A lot of cool memories in here, man. You get used to that culture, and it's like, oh, this isn't scary. This is just normal. This is everyday normal shit. Reality is most of the shit that goes down is is like retaliation type shit. And if you ain't involved, you really ain't got shit. To yeah, like about. we weren't going there on like gang banging type shit. We were going there on. 
music. And then we went straight from there to this other guy heard about us. His name was Big O. He had like better beats, better production, better studio. We recorded with him. That's when Yancey came in. Yancey was really good friends with O. The connection between the two of them is still present today. You would think they were brothers. They were always connected. That's the first time like we had a taste of any kind of success or yeah. feeling successful. How would I explain Adam? <laughs> Fearless, creative, I used to call him Hookmaster. Mises, lyrical. Just at a time where both the deliveries, the presence that they brought, it didn't make a difference where we took them. It was crazy and it was happening kind of fast. We were winning like open mic contests, battle contests. Yeah, we would go to the Cotton Oops. Club. We used to come here when we were young guys, 20, 21 years old. Every Tuesday we do open mics. And now it's all gentrified and there's like white gentrified. people walking around with fucking Labradors and poodles. Kids and shit, it's really weird. We got scooters. There's shit. fucking palm trees. You know we're yeah. safe if you see palm trees. I don't know what happened. I think I saw a kid on a leash. Yeah, it's very really weird. This is like 20 years ago. This is what it used to look like. Definitely doesn't look like that anymore. Chuck got us kicked out of here one night because he got real mad. He had a beer bottle and threw it across the bar to shatter. It's not a good night. I'm and sorry we were the only that. white people around. Now that's all that's here. Literally. <laughs> but I feel, it's, feel pretty comfortable now. Hey, you. I hate you more. <laughs> this guy's got another portal. There's portals everywhere. This place sucks. Get out of here. <laughs> this was never like this. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's just, it's different. You would never know the talent that they had in them and what they were capable of doing by looking at them. They came in, they were all cool and down to earth. But as soon as you put a microphone or some yeah. music, oh. the light switch. He would take pictures and photos and then he brings us to New York and he shops us to all these record labels because back then that was the only way to really get on was a record label. I really thought we were about to be like the most famous rappers on earth. Yeah. And they were always fighting each other to try to, <laughs> you know, be better. Me and Chuck kind of fell apart from doing music together. He didn't want to work with me anymore. <laughs> not true. Yeah, he had a different not true. He had a different path. <laughs> Chuck was just always does his own thing. You can't tell this motherfucker anything. He's just gonna do what he's gonna do. I was going all for it. I bought courtside seats next to Jay-Z to give him my demos and shit. I definitely had no plan B. So I ended up going to California, ended up living in my car. I turned 29 in prison. I turned 30 in prison. And I just forgot about rap. I didn't give a shit about it anymore. I had to dig myself out of this huge hole. I always thought that me and Chuck were gonna make it together. This project should have been done 20 years ago. This album, on top of two homies that grew up together forever and brothers doing a project together, on top of all the shit that we overcame to even put this project together. Things in life pulled us apart. Prison, homelessness, chasing down dreams, having separate visions of our own. Now it's time to make it happen. That's it. I don't give a fuck if I belong a rapper or not. I'm a rapper. Well, I remember saying that when I was a teenager. I'm a rapper and you get laughed at. I'm fucking laughing now. <laughs> Thanks. The end. I love you, brother. Likewise, my brother. Likewise. Likewise, you too. Love you. Love you. Likewise. Uh. If it's your world, then don't worry about it. Keep it 100, be thorough about it.